Hello, I'm John Stewart, president of the Florida Bar, and I'm joined by our newest Florida Supreme Court Justice, Justice John Coriel, who was kind enough to give us some time to, to talk with us uh, via Zoom for our first ever uh, Florida Bar Annual Virtual Convention. So Justice Coriel, thank you so much for taking the time out of your, I know, a very busy schedule uh, to take a few minutes with us today. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I wish this were happening in person. Yes, I think I think uh, I think we all we all wish it was happening in person, but we'll get back there um, before too long. Uh, I wanted to, you know, since you're the newest member of the court, I know there's been a lot of uh, press about it, but you know, for our members, just give you a chance to introduce your, uh, yourself. I mean, I know you have a, a, an exceptional background, and maybe just give us a little idea of kind of what you did before you became uh, appointed to the Florida Supreme Court. Sure. Well, I've, I've had exceptional teachers, really, is another way of saying that. Um, so I was born in, uh, in Miami, and I grew up in uh, the city of West Miami, mostly, which is a small town not far from Coral Gables. Um, I, uh, my folks came from Cuba in 1961. Uh, my father is uh, part of Operation Pedro Pan, which was a relocation effort for 14,000 or so unaccompanied minors. My mother came as part of an intact family. Um, she, uh, uh, her mother and father um, sort of worked a variety of jobs. My, uh, my maternal grandfather uh, got into the tile business, which wound up being a family business. My father then, when he met my mom, needed a trade and got a job from his future father-in-law in the tile business. Uh, and uh, they worked very hard. Um, neither one of them graduated college until later in life. Um, but uh, they, they, they uh, worked exceedingly hard so that I was denied nothing and uh, um, went to Catholic school in the, uh, in the Miami area. Uh, and then I went to Harvard College and Harvard Law School um, where I studied um, social studies and that sort of means history and philosophy. And um, Then um, at the law school took a real interest in um, transnational crime, especially the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, and uh, after law school, I clerked for Judge John Bates in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Um, it was um, 2003, and so that court was extremely busy with the work of, um, you know, national security in the post-9/11 era. Um, judge Bates went on to be the chief judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, and so the clerkship had both a strong regulatory component and a strong national security component. Um, after my clerkship, I joined uh, Davis Polk and Wardwell in New York. I was actually a deal lawyer first. I did uh, capital markets, credit work, uh, mergers and acquisitions um, in Latin America and in Spain. And uh, was at Davis Polk uh, for about five years. Toward the end of my time at Davis Polk, uh, sort of picking up on my interest in, in school and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, Davis Polk was uh, engaged to represent Siemens AG in what is still a landmark U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case. And at the time, uh, the FCPA wasn't what it is today in terms of a specialty. Uh, you know, firms today have huge compliance and anti-corruption practices, and it wasn't the case back then quite as, quite as it is today. And so even though I was a corporate lawyer, there was sort of a general call-up for anybody who was interested in the FCPA, and that was me. Uh, and uh, that was a very fateful case for me because it um, really gave me a lot of uh, interest in transnational crime, money laundering, um, uh, issues of cross-border regulatory and government enforcement uh, issues. Uh, and it ultimately made me want to be a prosecutor. Uh, and so in about 2008, I, um, I tried to become a prosecutor, ultimately succeeding in, um, at home. Uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida. And so in 2009, I came home as an assistant U.S. Attorney um, and uh, rotated through that office's appeals, major crimes and economic crime sections. Uh, the focus of my work as an AUSA was uh, uh, you know, money laundering. I did some um, public integrity work against um, both U.S. and non-U.S. persons who were engaged either in corruption or money laundering activities. And then the grist of the mill for, you know, AUSAs, generally speaking, um, narcotics enforcement, firearms enforcement, um, immigration enforcement crimes. Did that for three years. And then in 2012, 
I left the U.S. Attorney's Office to run for office. I ran for the state Senate against the late, great Senator Glenn Margolis. Uh, and uh, I can't say enough about her as a public servant. It was a real honor uh, to be a footnote in her political career. She was the first woman to be president in the Senate, and she beat me very easily. Uh, and uh, undeterred, I decided that I would uh, try running again later in life. I joined uh, Cobra and Kim, um, which is an international firm that focuses solely on disputes and investigations, typically in matters involving fraud. Um, so you know, the uh, in, uh, representation of victims of Ponzi, Ponzi schemes or um, individual criminal defendants, corporations that are uh, subject to law enforcement action, usually by more than one sovereign. Um, did a lot of work involving insolvency at Cobra and Kim. Uh, had the uh, privilege of representing the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico uh, as it uh, investigated the causes of Puerto Rico's financial crisis and determined what claims it might have on behalf of uh, Puerto Rico. Um, ran for office again in the mix, uh, trying to be a, a state representative. Lost again in 2016. Um, and so at that point, really decided that I was going to just focus on private practice for a while uh, and did that um, and uh, was um, honored beyond words when, um, when this opportunity presented itself uh, because I think it allows me to um, serve the public in a way that builds on the legal career that I wound up developing while I was waiting for a chance to serve in another way. It's just, I think, a lesson about how life sometimes works despite your best plans. So that's, that's my story, professionally speaking, in a nutshell. Much more important than any of this, um, I am married to Rebecca Tunkel, who is an intensive care unit physician and a, a professor of medicine at Florida International University's Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. And we have two children, Jonas, who is nine, and Eden, who's seven. Well, you know, it's an impressive background and, and, you know, you, you know, as, as any good trial lawyer does, uh, you set me up or maybe any good justice, you set me up for my next question. You know, I know a lot of your colleagues have talked about not only your distinguished career, but you know, how important family life is to you and you know, to have such a challenging career. Uh, your wife obviously has a very challenging career on her own, you know, balancing, you know, the, that work-life balance is something that, that, I think all professionals struggle with lawyers are no exception and uh, you know just would love to get your take for our members on uh, you know how, how how you've managed or what it's meant to you to kind of try to maintain that work-life balance with those challenging careers that you and your wife have. I wish I, I wish I had something to say other than we do a poor job of it like I think everybody feels they do and you sort of scramble every day to try and and cover it um, you know I, I, I will say that it helps to try and put yourself in everyone else's shoes. Um, and so, um, you know, when, when, uh, when I'm, I feel like I'm not being a very effective parent, I try to put myself in Jonas or Eden's shoes and, and sort of assess what they must think I'm thinking. And when I um, am not being as useful as, as, I sh as I should be, I try to put myself in Becky's shoes and imagine um, what she's feeling. And I think that works for all of us um, as sort of a check, just like, you know, am I, am I doing what I would want someone to do for me given, given what's going on uh, in, in my professional life right now. Uh, I don't know that I have any more wisdom to share with, with uh, the members of the bar than that. One, one thing I will say is I'm, I'm very proud uh, and, and happy and, and thankful to be an adoptive parent. Uh, and uh, that's a, a cause that I care a great deal about and that I know is very important in the bar. Uh, and so my, uh, I, I have a strong sense of um, advocacy to folks who consider adoption and and, um, and 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 I think it is just a life changing thing. Yeah, that's uh, that's um, that's wonderful. I mean, it's uh, it's a lot. I mean, work life balance. I mean, no one's figured it out. So any tidbits of advice we get are always a bonus. We're always looking for for something to help us all out. We all struggle with that from time to time. Um, I know that uh, very short time on on the bench of the four Supreme Court, but you've already jumped right in. I've, I've had the chance to talk to a few of your colleagues already uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, and, you know, I know you participated in uh, oral argument already. So you're probably, you already probably have the uh, distinction of being the only Florida Supreme Court justice to only participate in a virtual or remote oral arguments. So, I'm, you know, I'm curious, 
you know, what you think about that and just sort of, you know, technology in general. I mean, we've been, I would say, uh, accelerated the learning curve greatly for most lawyers, you know, uh, in terms of, of technology and for the courts as well, probably would have preferred doing it in, in a state other than a health pandemic. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, how was that experience for you, kind of the virtual oral argument and then, you know, anything that you, that you like to offer in terms of technology and the profession or technology in your role, it would be great. It was, it was probably the most fun I've ever had at work. Um, I was, uh, I had the good fortune to be uh, sworn in by uh, Judge Barbara Lagoa, whose um, seat I took on the, on the court. She happens to live just a few blocks away and we had a socially distanced and, uh, and mask wearing, uh, swearing in in my backyard. Uh, the day before, uh, we were set for oral argument. I, uh, my, my appointment was announced, I think, on a Wednesday or Thursday of, a, of the preceding week, and we had oral argument on Tuesday. And I decided that I would just dive in uh, and spend that weekend preparing as best I could for oral argument, um, understanding the awesome responsibility that uh, deciding any of these cases is. And my colleagues have been amazing at helping me uh, come up to speed quickly so that I can do the work that I've been charged with doing and I'm so very grateful uh, that I get an opportunity to do and I, I want the members of the bar to know that I'm going to race to the work every day uh, and I wanted that message to be very clear. So I borrowed a robe, uh, uh, Judge Lagoa's robes probably would have fit me, uh, but um, her father-in-law, uh, Judge Paul Huck, who's uh, been a teacher and mentor to me and many others who um, have had a good, the good fortune to be assistant U.S. attorneys in Miami, let me borrow his robe, and he's more or less exactly my size. He's more spelt than I am, but um, I borrowed his robe, and I did uh, the 11 cases that were set for oral argument uh, from our office upstairs, and uh, uh, oftentimes, if you're, if you're watching the tape, you'll see, you'll see me go like this, and that's usually me signaling one of my children to stay out of the camera, um, and, uh, you know, I was terrified that one of them would just, like, walk over, you know, with their iPads for me to unlock it with like a passcode or, you know, to ask me to sharpen their pencil or something. And, and uh, a couple times they actually did encroach and I was able to stop video very quickly. Um, but I felt like that guy on the BBC, you know, the, and here I am wearing a borrowed robe, you know, talking to counsel about, you know, important questions and, you know, hoping that one of my kids doesn't totter into the back with, you know, a, a, you know, a bunch of slime that they just made that they want me to play with. And, and such is the, um, the life of, of everybody these days. So um, it, was, it was actually just a, an amazing experience. I, I got to start um, this chapter of my life at home with a lot of help from family and friends. Yeah, it's great. Well, you have, uh, yeah, as you pointed out, we're all, we're all trying to deal with keeping various kids or pets or something at bay while we're trying to work you know, properly, remotely, socially, distantly. Um, I'm sure that everybody will appreciate hearing that even a Florida Supreme Court justice has those issues as well. We just assumed that that was never- Nobody, nobody calls me Justice Coriel in this building. I don't know. It's like the memo hasn't, hasn't reached this particular uh, department. Um, right. Here, right. Well, here, here I'm, I'm, not, I'm not referred to in those terms. So. Right. Well, it's good, right? It's good to keep you grounded. I think, uh, you know, just hearing you uh, speak, and I know we haven't had a chance to meet um, yet face to face, I look forward to to when we do. Um, but you know, you have you have a lot of great background and a lot of great uh, connections. At least uh, I think that that will help. I mean, you know, the Florida Supreme Court is really the boss of the bar, the Florida bar. You know, we answer to you all. Um, you all have been you know, the court has historically been fantastic to us. This year has been no exception. Um, I know Judge Huck is introducing uh, President Elect to be Mike Tanner. Uh, so you have that connection. Uh, my successor, President-elect, soon to be President Dory Foster Morales, her husband on the hook, you know, her husband Jimmy Morales. He's, I think, also a double double Harvard person. I won't hold I won't hold that against them. Yeah. So so you so you have some, yeah, you have some good some good uh, starting points there. So I, I think it's going to be uh, great. I know that uh, that week of oral argument, everyone, uh, all the justices were saying how busy that was. So you jumped in in a terribly uh, busy time, and I know they were happy to have you. Um, and I know you're never going to leave the bench, uh, uh, the Supreme Court. Nobody, nobody hopes that you do. But if you do, you could maybe tap 
chief justice candidate on some election tactics because he certainly is savvy uh, in that regard. Um, but uh, you told us a lot, you know. So, uh, but I've asked everybody this question. So, what what do you think would you know our members might be uh, surprised to learn about our newest uh, Supreme Court justice? Well, I know it's in politic to save these days, but I did not grow up wanting to be a judge. Um, I, uh, I actually grew up first wanting to be an astronaut, and I'm kind of a uh, space and aviation geek. Uh, in fact, one, one job that I think, you know, truth be told, I'd have a hard time turning down is if someone ever asked me to go work for NASA. But given my uh, cardiovascular health, I don't think I'm in any danger of that. Um, that said, one, one interesting thing about me, I guess, is that I, I, I've had the good fortune to travel twice the speed of sound. Uh, when I was 11 years old, uh, my uh, uncle, um, who when he left Cuba, this is my great uncle, had the good, the good idea of, of um, getting into the travel business here and focusing on serving the Cuban American community and then ultimately others, uh, started a travel agency in uh, Coral Gables, it still exists, called Lorraine Travel. And when I was about 11, uh, Lorraine Travel had this um, uh, around the world on the Concord uh, ticket that they were selling, I think for British Airways. And because they sold so many of them, I think British Airways gave them an incentive ticket. And my uncle Jack, who knew that I was a geek about space and aviation, gave to me as a birthday present, a trip on the Concord from London to New York, one leg. Uh, and so I went to London with my mom and some of my aunts and uncles and had a great time and then flew back in two hours and 58 minutes at a little over twice the speed of sound. Uh, and it was a great flight. My, my best memory of the flight is that uh, Colonel Frank Gorman, who uh, was one of the Apollo astronauts, was on the moon and then went on to be the CEO of Pan Am. And I, of course, being a dork, knew all of this, uh, asked me if I was going to finish my caviar on the Concorde. And of course, I had no interest in the caviar, so he doesn't need that. And I, so Frank Gorman stole my caviar on, on the Concorde. <laughs> I think uh, also, I think also um, there was, I don't think, I don't think it was Keith Richards, but, but I think one member of the Rolling Stones was on that plane too. And it's the coolest thing that ever happened to me. So it's all downhill from there. Well, it's, yeah, it would, it would be hard. It would be hard to beat that for sure. <laughs> that, that's an exciting, uh, exciting experience, especially for 11 year old. It'd be an exciting experience now. Yeah. Uh, so um, listen, I, I want to thank you for your time. I know that this is, uh, you know, like you mentioned, you're, you're diving right in full steam. I uh, want to welcome you, uh, you know, to the court. Uh, you know, I've gotten some tips. So if you if you get to see some of the videos from uh, some of the other justices that I've talked to this week, um, I've asked them, and they've offered you a few few tips. So maybe you'll you'll pick up something on there uh, about being a new justice. But we really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are. Uh, we're very excited for you. We're very excited to to have you as you know one of the leaders, overseers uh, of of the bar and of our members ultimately um and uh, know you're going to be fantastic uh, as the as the senior person on this call uh, not by age but by rank uh, you get the last word so uh, anything you want to add in conclusion to our members justice coriel it, it's all yours only that i'm very grateful for the work that uh, members of the bar do to promote the uh, the rule of law and public service in our state and i look forward to being an advocate and supporter of yours for many many years to come and hopefully next year we can have this conversation in person so thank you all very much thank you justice uh, john coriel the florida supreme court joining us for the first ever uh, annual virtual convention of the florida bar justice thank you very much for your time